And we are back for the final G Steph draft, the Storm of Swords one. Um, Preston, please remind the audience that there will be no Dance of Dragons. It's just, it was Feast, Game of Thrones, yeah, Clash, right. and Storm. Well, or or a Dance with Dragons was already done, like with Feast. I mean, maybe later stuff, you know, um, will will eventually be opened up. But that there are drafts of a Dance with Dragons that are not available to the public. But the mm-hmm. early drafts of a, of a Dance with Dragons, it was still combined with a Feast for Crows, and so we already covered that material. This the stuff on, you know, there's some stuff on on Tyrion and and. Um, uh, I don't know what else, what other early stuff was there that we that on a, on a dance with dragons material. Danny, there's some early Danny stuff we talked about and stuff like that. But um, yeah, no, we 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 um, we covered. We did a video on on changes to the draft of uh, Dance with Dragons and Feast for Crows. We have a video on changes of the draft to a Game of Thrones. We have uh, a video on changes to the drafts uh, with uh, a Clash of Kings. And this is our final our final one. Unless unless something changes, unless something opens up to the public, but um, on on a dance with dragons. But this is the uh, the final um, book of of changes of early drafts that J- that George had, and what mm-hmm. you know to to what he put in the final his published version. And so today we're talking about a, a storm of swords, um, a storm of swords. Now we got to remember the storm of swords is a very unusual book in that George wrote it just at lightning speed, lightning speed, much really? faster. What, I mean, obviously much, much faster than Dance and Feast, but he wrote it faster than even a Game of Thrones and a Clash of Kings. Um, any specific reason? Maybe he was running out of money? <laughs> I don't know. Some people say, some people theorize that because A Storm of Swords is kind of closing up stories and concluding them, that George is going faster. And I've heard similar stuff like when, when that some people thought years ago that Winds was going to be, was going to come out quicker than Dance because he'd be closing up plot lines and resolving stuff and get, and he would get faster. And some people, you know, still say the same thing about A Dream of Spring. They're like, oh, if Winds comes out, then he'll, he'll just be wrapping everything up. So it'll, It'll be easy for him. He he knows exactly where the story is going. I don't buy any of that. Um, I think <laughs> that I think uh, Storm is fast because George is using a different writing style. He is he is trying to pump out a book that uh, is a page turner. It's very different in style to the other four. Um, it's it's a very which is why I think it's also many people's favorite is that it sticks out. It sticks out with a lot of action. Um, it sticks out where just the writing style is not so uh, precise with you know little little references here and there that that a dance with dragons and a feast for crows is filled with that I think you and I love Carmine. We love all the little details that he shoves in there. Um, but it's it's I don't know. Some people say it's this, this just this perfect sweet spot. Um, you know, there's just so much. There's so much excitement in it, and it's just kind of breezy. You know, John, John battling on the wall, Tyrion's trial, Lady Stoneheart, um, uh, um, Sansa in the veil, purple wedding. You know, Lysa going through the moon door. Just so many things. So many things uh, like stick out from this book, from A Storm of Swords as like these great moments, but, um, um, to, uh, to, to put this in perspective for non book readers, um, in the show, storm of swords, the the third book was broken up to season three and four, because there was just so much stuff there. They had to just break it up. Otherwise everything would have been rushed. Yeah, I suppose though in the show, Arya does wander around the riverlands quite a bit. (laughs) Yeah, but that's that what is, she does uh, in the. Hmm. I mean, it's kind of funny because it's like, for the most part, the Arya story from A Clash of Kings and A Storm of Swords, many people think drags because it's just her wandering the Riverlands for two books, meeting various bands of outlaws. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's, it, she meets, she meets 
Faceless Men and Amory Lorch's Men and the Brave Companions and the Brotherhood Without Banners and then the Hound. And it's just it's just it's her and outlaws wandering the Riverlands. And then the show just was like, well, we'll just rush it. And she'll bre- she'll meet the Brotherhood Without Banners briefly. And then she'll be with the Hound doing nothing for for a while. So. But uh, yeah, uh, but um, so this discussion of like a storm being so fast means that there's not as many drafts and like the draft we, that, that exists, um, you know, gets so much, gets so much gets written after it. So, so, um, this is kind of where we start as you say that the, the library is a storm of swords draft is from July, 1999, roughly 10 months before George finalized the manuscript and contains 574 manuscript pages, roughly 38% of the final text. That means George wrote two thirds of a storm of swords in 10 months. Jesus Christ. Right. Those like are good days. this, this Those manuscript are good days. pages, that's kind of, you know, you could maybe say, Oh, that's a lot of leftover from clash kind of stuff. But, um, it's just, it was just such a, such a booming period. That's a, thousand manuscript pages that he wrote in a 10 month so period. so i uh i play this uh, i unfortunately play this video game destiny 2 and whenever destiny 2 comes out with like new cosmetic dlc the, yeah. the joke in the community is rents due they're, they're putting this out right. right now because rents due and i'm assuming this is why george was writing so fast rent was due yeah yeah it may be i mean things were kind of blowing up with it but storm of swords is really the one that where everything blew up um so I don't know. I mean, by comparison, he wrote he wrote a, a, essentially around a thousand manuscript pages in ten months. If we believe his report, he he's he's taken twelve years, thirteen years to write a thousand manuscript pages for wins. It's just such a it's such a strange strange comparison. But anyway, um, then he says by. By raw word count, the edits to Storm are unquestionably more extensive than for Clash and Game. They mostly take the form of heavier wordsmithing and entire pr- uh, of the entire prose. There, I- there are no changes to major subplots on the same level as the deletion of glass candles from Clash or changes to Victorian's fate late in the writing of Feast, but some of that wordsmithing may have significant have significance to George's biggest mysteries. Um, the best example of yeah, this is kind of interesting because it's not as you say in the later books. There's there's deleted chapters, there's whole subplots, characters that should be dead are not dead, and in Clash, you know there was the the glass candle situation, but here he's saying nothing much changes, but little word changes go through are, are in it. So he spent a lot of time. You know, he, essentially, he, he he breezily wrote quickly and then like went back and and edited his own work. Um, he didn't like painstakingly go through it slowly. Um, anyway, the best example of that comes in with uh, George's edits in the story of the Night of the Laughing Tree um, from A Storm of Swords, Brand Two. It's Mira telling the story. The protagonist is the young Cranagman. Clearly Mira's father, Helen Reed, though she doesn't say that. According to Mira, he could talk to trees and weave words and make castles appear and disappear. The story begins with Howland leaving his home in the neck and visiting the mysterious Isle of Faces. He spends a winter there with the green men with the green men before continuing south. Here's how Howland's time on the Isle of Faces is described in the published book. All that the all that winter the Cranigman stayed on the Isle. Oh, all that winter the Cranigman stayed on the Isle. But when the spring broke, he heard the wide world calling, and knew the time had come to leave. His skin boat was just where he'd left it, so he said his farewells and paddled off towards shore. Um, and this is this is from the ninety nine draft. The Cranigman dwelled on the Isle for most of the of that winter. But when spring broke, he heard the wide world calling and he knew the time had come to leave. His skin boat had just 
just where he left it. So he said his farewells to the trees and paddled off to shore. Um, so he, he just said farewell. The difference is he just said to the trees, right? He said the farewell to the trees. Um, uh, so so G stuff is, is, is saying here, these few words, um, there are a few wording changes here, but the most significant is the shortening of the phrase said farewell to the trees to just said his said his farewells. Reasonably, pe reasonable people can dif differ, but I think that phrase is potentially a major hint that the nature of the nature of the green men, um, the green men are in some sense trees. <clears throat> um, is is your head swirling that when he's saying goodbye to the trees, he's either saying goodbye to Blood Raven or time traveling Bran? No, I think. <sighs> So the problem is the werewoods aren't green. Um, you know, if the werewoods had green leaves like other trees and you said, oh, they're saying goodbye to the green men, you could say, oh, well, the green men are trees because trees are green, you know, but werewoods aren't green. Werewoods are red. They have red leaves and white bark. Um, and you could say like, oh, the the green is some aspect of nature and maybe we're supposed to think that the green is some aspect of nature, but we don't know anything. There's no green aspect to werewoods. So that's what I think is kind of a little weird there. Um, keep in mind, George's first use of the word green dreams comes from a short story. He wrote uh, starring tough, Haviland Tuff for Tuff Voyaging called Guardians. And he, he describes a hive-minded alien race telepathically talking to each other musically. And he calls their he calls their musical thoughts going back and forth to each other green dreams. Um and so the green, like George's idea of green and like hive-minded telepathy wasn't necessarily related to chlorophyll <laughs> and like the, the greenness of nature. Um, it was just a color that he kind of pulled out of nowhere to represent telepathy. Hmm. So I don't necessarily think that like the green men are, are green in the sense that they're like leaves. However, when he says, I, I, you know, I think it's just simpler. Like if he's saying farewell to the trees, it may be that like Howland Reed was bonding and connecting to the tree in the same way that Bran was bonding and connecting to the tree, you know, and that like Howland going to the Isle of Faces and leaving is very similar to Bran going to the, the B Blood Raven's cave and leaving or something like that. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the point, if, if that's the point that G stuff is, is hinting at or what, but, um, it, you know, this doesn't tell me any kind of nature, like thing about the nature of the green men themselves. Like, obviously I think the green men are connected to the werewoods somehow, but, um, anyway, but this possible, this shouldn't be too, be su too surprising. The story already contains one human hi tree hybrid. And both Blood Raven and the Green Men have connections to the Children of the Forest. Um, it's not that I don't think the Green Men are connected to the to the, uh, the trees. I don't necessarily think that saying goodbye to the trees is saying that the Green Men are trees. I I do think the Green Men are, are like connected to the trees, but I think it's hinting that that Howland was connecting to the trees in the same way Bran was, and that he's saying goodbye to them. Yeah, I think that's fair. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, anyway, the limited description of what of we have of the Green Men also includes tree-like elements. Uh, later in the same chapter, Bran says to old Nan that the Green Men had leaves instead of hair. Well, 
that I mean, that idea does lend to them being green. But again, like weirwood leaves should be red. Um, but uh, I've told you, I've told you the theory about like why the green men, why the green the 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 green men have antlers that they're that they're actually weirwood branches that they that they've stuck on their heads. Right to connect themselves uh, better yeah. to the weirwood net, which like is very similar to the Grishka aspect of, of a song for Leah. And like, it's funny. Cause like when, when I first heard, when I first heard the theory that the green men had stapled branches to their heads or whatever, at first I was like, that sounds pretty crazy. And then I thought for like just a minute, I was like, no, that really makes sense. That, that completely makes sense in every George R. R. Martin way that, that they just were shoved like, attaching branches to their heads to try to to try to connect um but anyway the, there's a section on the green men in the world of ice and fire that says their clothes are green perhaps misinterpretation of leaves or moss don't the children of the forest wear wear leaves for clothes oh there's so many different artists interpretation of the children and I'm trying not to confuse it with the ones in the show. Yeah. Um, blood, la blood Raven's nature could be foreshadowing the nature of the green men. Um, sure. There he is. Problems. Old Nan says the green men were thought to ride elk, which doesn't sound tree like and particularly uh, and that particular tree that blood Raven is merging with the weirwood is instantly recognized because the trunks and leaves are not green. Yes, uh, so G stuff is aware of these same the same problems here. The, uh, the alternative interpretation of the deleted said farewell of the trees might be that Howland was able to communicate with the werewoods and, and also believed that are also believed to populate the isle and that the children, the green men and the werewoods form a trinity of ice magic mediums that coexist on the isle. Yeah, probably something like that. I, I think it's just Howland had, had connected to the werewoods and then he, he said goodbye. And that's, you know, who knows what's going. Yeah, the, the Green Manor are whatever, like the, they've they've attached werewoods to their to their head. Um, and yeah, you're, you're correct. The, the children of the forest were clo uh, clo cloaks of leaves and they had uh, vines and, and, and leaves and, and flowers in their hair, weaved into their hair. Yeah. In addition to this change, there are a few other interesting changes to the story of the Night of the Laughing Tree worth mentioning. One of the next events in Howland's story is that he's attacked by three squires soon after arriving at the tourney. As published, he's rescued... He's rescued by the She-Wolf, who most readers understand to be Ly Lyanna Stark. But in the draft, the Kranig Man is rescued by the Wild Wolf, Brandon Stark, hmm. Ned and Lyanna's dead brother. Here's the diversion. Um, and that's my father's men. You're kicking a wolf on four legs or two, said Bran. Two, said Mira. He scattered the squires with a tourney sword, swatting them with the flat of his blade. The Kranig man was bruised and bloodied. So, so the wild wolf took him back to his lair where, where his maiden sister cleaned his cuts and bound him up with linen. Soon the whole pack had gathered in the tent, the wolf squire and serving men and friends and the two young brothers as well. The middle brother was quiet and serious. The youngest, a playful pup. Um... How do you feel about it being Brandon, <laughs> like uh, scattering the, the the people instead of Liana? Uh, I, I like the original, uh, and I feel as though the reason he changed it from Brandon to Liana is to probably connect it to the Night of the Laughing Tree that she is the Night of the Laughing Tree. Well, it, certainly without this, certainly without Liana, like going out and smacking him with a tourney sword. You don't get the idea that Leon is a tomboy, you know, I agree. That, you know, and, and you kind of need that idea that Leon is a tomboy to suspect her as the Knight of the laughing tree. Um, on the other hand, 
Brandon has is given so little in in the in the story that it's almost sad that this is taken away from him because we now know essentially nothing about him to make him seem like a good guy. I mean, you know, he gets angry about his sister and he, he like goes in to try to rescue his dad and like strangles himself trying to rescue his dad. But we just kind of think of him as being a hot headed asshole. Um, and this would actually be like a, a moment where Brandon is trying to defend the, the, the meek, you know, it would be a, an actual positive thing about Brandon Stark, which we don't uh, have in the story. That, that makes you, you make a good point there, but at the same time, we, I mean, the information we later get on Brandon, um, in regards to Barbary Dustin, was that, was that her that he, uh. Yeah. Had the uh, okay. I want to go into detail, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, you have a that's a good point, but at the same time, I do feel as though George was trying to point the reader that the Night of the Laughing Tree might have been Liana, so that's why the mm. change. He he wanted to make that connection there, but yeah, yeah. I, I see what you I see what you I see mm-hmm. your point about Brandon. Yeah, I mean, it's it's also interesting that so I've I've. I've read different theories on on Night of La- the Night of the Laughing Tree, and you know a, most fans believe it's Liana, but I have heard, but I've had the the, the logic that it's actually Ned is it's just so mm. much more logical that it's Ned, you know, like Give Ned was raised in the Vale where they they would joust more, right. um, but if you if you took this paragraph uh, um and then you think of the night of the laughing tree you have nothing to really connect it to liana so you might you might more quickly assume it's ned and that you know like liana he makes it could be that he's making liana the red herring by having her be the star of the story and then and then when the night of the laughing tree appears you assume it's liana as most readers as most fans do assume it's liana but if if it is Ned, then it it's quite you know because you're giving the role of caretaker to Liana in this. Oh, she she cleaned up the cuts, so you're like, oh, she's just a traditional woman, and so now you're like, who's the Ned of the Laughing Tree? Oh, you immediately think it's like one of the guys, so it's 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 probably Ned. Well. If you if you make Liana the 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 tomboy and star of the story, you start thinking it's Liana, and if it is actually Ned, then then you know she's a red herring. It, uh, so real quick, I, I don't mean to jump ahead, but um, <laughs> when how how long is it from Heron Hall incident to the end of Robert's Rebellion? What is that? A year, almost two. Uh, what Heron Hall's in Heron Hall's in uh, eighty one or something. 281 and the Robert's Rebellion is 283. Yeah. So yeah, the reason I bring this up, the reason I bring this up is if that if Helen can, uh, it would make sense if it was Ned in the sense that when Ned goes to rescue Liana, Helen would come with him because they're besties. Maybe Mm -hmm. Helen figured it out or maybe Ned told him. Um, But at the same time, it would also make sense if it was Liana, because Helen owes her. So mm-hmm. that's why he comes with Ned to the Tower of Joy. Because why the fuck would you bring Helen Reed, of all people, to the Tower of Joy when he couldn't even beat up a couple squires? You going to take him to fight Kingsguard? <sighs> I say yeah. this as someone who does not like Helen Reed. Not because of your reasons, because I know people are going to say, like, you hate Howlin' Reed, and therefore I got to... No, because Arthur Dane's the GOAT. How the fuck does... <laughs> how the fuck right, does Howlin' right. Reed beat Arthur Dane? But, um, yeah, so it, it, it actually makes sense both ways. It does. It does. I mean, the thing is, it's so abstract and so little information that, yeah, a lot of, a lot of different solutions make sense. <clears throat> Um, there's another small difference in the above passage worth mentioning. The pup is generally assumed to be the youngest Stark, Benjen. Um, but in the published version, it doesn't include the word playful. Uh, by the time we meet Benjen at the wall, he is described as dark and serious. Others have suggested 
something may have changed Benjen's personality around the time he joined the watch. The description of young Benjen as playful could be considered more evidence of this. Yeah, I mean, we get asked this all the time. People ask me all the time, like, why, why did Benjen join the Night's Watch? Like, what was the reason? Um, and yeah, if, if you could just say, well, we pull for honor or whatever, but there seems to be something more to that. And, um, if you, if you describe him as playful and then serious, well, then there's been some major change to the guy. Um, I mean, for instance, Aaron Dampere was a playful dude and then he went through a life changing experience of, of nearly dying and then all of a sudden was very different was 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 dark and serious so you know we're, you're expecting some other huge change in vengeance character but then he just removed the word playful so maybe he was dark and serious from the beginning who knows <laughs> um anyway in the draft version it also contains a deleted reference to Rhaegar's newborn son being present um the king presented his new grandson to the lords assembled on the golden shield which uh i mean it changes his changes Rhaegar's or changes Aegon's age quite a bit if we do that um many he removed that if Aegon being alive during the tourney would have changed the chronology slightly, it was supposed to, he was still supposed to be an infant when killed by Gerger Clegane during the sack. If he were an infant during the tourney, he'd have probably won one, 1 1.5 years old during the sack, which in my opinion is beyond the cutoff of an infant. Uh, many one-year-olds can walk. Perhaps others can think of some significance to this, but it's also possible that it just doesn't add anything to the story and was deleted for space. I think that, you know, I'm trying to think like why we think that the Harrenhal tourney was in 81. Because well, don't they say during a spring? But like at what point, yeah, it's Storm of Swords, the year of the false spring, so it's like within this book that that George places the tourney when it was. It could very be, well be that George wanted the tourney closer to the to the rebellion, like in 282 or something. And so and only later was he like pushing it back. Um, so it, it, it's hard to say because the pushing of the tourney back changes everything. I mean, it changes things about like Ashara, Ashara being pregnant and who was the father and all sorts of weird stuff. And, and like what happened at the tourney and, um, you know, had the, had the Heron Hall been later, it would have been a very different, you know, our calculations on, on baby swaps and parentage would be different, but you know, it is what it is. But, uh, Anyway, anything else to talk about with the uh, the, the Heron Hall tourney and Night of the Laughing Tree and Howland Reed? Uh, no, I, I I think I think you pretty much covered that section. Um, yeah, as for keep keep keeping hmm, changing Aegon's age, I guess it's easier to have the story be more believable that Varys switched them out. Yes, sure, true. Whatever. I mean, it's much easier to swap a. A, a little a little baby versus a some toddler. squirming baby that's almost one you know mm -hmm. <laughs> um there are a few small changes in the draft that might uh, provide hints to the nature of the others if you squint uh the first of these occurs in the draft version of john 2 as john and mance are inspecting corpses at the fist of the first men who did this no women of no men of woman born. Mance Raider had been kneeling over a corpse that looked like Brown Bernard, but uh, but now he stood. Um, it's very Shakespearean to be like no men of woman born. That's that's Macbeth. Um, yeah, and it's it's one of the the, the things that uh, the witches tell him, right? The, uh -huh. the prophecy. Yeah, that's right. And doesn't Mac Macduff eventually kill him? And and what's his what's right? Macduff's because he's reasoning? a C-section. He's a C-section movie of uh, C-section. Right. That's it. You know. Um. 
which is, <laughs> I mean, we all accept it because it's Shakespeare, but yeah, that Nick, that makes no sense, you know. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, by the way, completely. So you're skipping Arya? Uh, did I did I pass? Did I pass Arya? Did I go that fast? Oh crap! I'm sorry. It was just no, no. You want to just go back to Arya after we're done? We'll go back to Arya after the nature of the others. Yeah, short. Um, one of the unanswered questions about the others is where they come from. Are they somehow created from humans or? Um, do they have wholly unrelated biology? There's evidence for both positions in the books, but this deleted line could be perhaps taken as a hint that they're unrelated to men. There's no reason to think that Mance is an expert in the others, but he is um, a better position to understand than most characters. And George also gives some um, some gives his fictional characters unearned wisdom for the sake of storytelling and, and foreshadowing. There's another deleted example of Mance having correct instincts on the other uh, others after instructing Harna to forget Mormon's Mormon Mance originally said if the others did not linger here to raise these dead it can only mean they're hunting down the living Mance is right about this as the very next chapter shows in which Sam is is hunted by and eventually defeats the uh, another that chapter contains a second possible deleted hint about the creature's nature at the end of Sam's first A, Song of, uh, a Storm of Swords chapter, after Sam stabs the other with the dragon glass dagger, the published book says that the other tries to pull out the dagger, but where its fingers touched the obsidian, they smoked. Originally, George said that its fingers melted instead of smoked. Uh, I think it's very likely that George made this change simply because he liked the imagery of fingers smoking more than melting, but the fact that he considered melting plausible in the first place could be a sign that the others are made of ice or some other some other elemental matter and not derived from flesh which does not melt um yeah but george george is kind of weird though with like what burns and what melts gold melting <laughs> you know like gold like gold melting and being able to pour it over Viserys's head like no not at that temperature but um so who knows? But uh, I know at some point George does say that the others are never born. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I mean, because of the, because of TV, we're all we're all in this idea that uh, that the babies are just transformed into others, and so that transformation could say that they're not born. You know they're transformed and that's where the way they come from like saying like but know. the idea we, we discussed this briefly last time the idea yeah. and then uh, i think one of the one and something we've done the idea that like because we never see the babies actually transforming in the show at least into the white walkers but I, it's like alluded okay fine but so the moment the night king puts his or whoever it is in the books puts their hand on the child the eyes glow blue and then they all of a sudden grow like super quickly Oh, you, like, I'm just assuming there's like an other. First of all, with regards to that baby, okay, I'm assuming they left him behind north of the wall, and he was like a toddler. And then when Arya stabbed the Night King and all of the 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 guys shattered, that that toddler north of the wall shattered. <laughs> like that's that's just what I'm assuming. But why? But why have the toddler though? Like that—that's what confuses me. This is like, are they using it for sustenance? Are they eating it? No, no. Like, the, he eventually grows up into a full, a full-sized other. Eventually grows up, or grows instantly, like some kind of werewolf transformation. I, I how does? I mean, that I didn't work? think about the instantaneous, but yeah, I mean, he—I just figured he—he he eventually grew up and into an old other. Maybe they use the young ones for like manual labor back at back in in other city. Um, <laughs> <laughs> someone's someone's gotta someone's gotta like you know run the trains and 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 clean up the you know make the food, clean Preston, the streets. Preston, the, the in children, other city. The, the White Walker children yearn for the mines. Preston, don't you know? Yeah, oh. they're working in the mines. It's only the super old ones that go out that go out attacking people. 
Because, yeah, they specifically all look like old men and, like, somehow have beards and whatnot. Remember that? But, but, yeah. but this is in the show. Whatever. Yeah, the yeah. show. Books is different. Uh, by the way, completely random. I, I've never asked you this question in regards to the White Walkers in the show. Hmm. I This is one of the things that you and I have discussed um, about the show, how the show did a lot of things better than the books. I, I have to throw in another one. Um, I like White Walkers better than the others. I don't know. White Walkers sounds more fantasy ish. It sounds more mystical. It sounds like. Oh, I see. Creepy. Yeah. Hmm. I've never liked the, the others or even Neverborn sounds kind of lame. Um, yeah, just, yeah. I don't know. White Walkers sounds more ancient, mystical, creepy. I see what you're saying. You know, others, I mean, others has more um, thematic weight, but. If we're going with the show, they never leaned into the thematic weight, you know, because like you use the word other and we think of like, you know, otherizing immigrants or something, otherizing, you know, Russians in our, you know, in 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 the world of warfare and and our, our cultures otherize other cultures, right? To make them to make them the foreigners, mm. to make them the outsiders. And when they're the outsiders, like they're no longer human and we can kill them easily and things like this. Um Good point. But in this situation, the others, at least in the show, are essentially just pure evil. And they should have been otherized. And and it's fine that they're otherized and it's fine that they were killed. You know? And you're like, oh, then what point are you making about war? Oh, none. <laughs> you know? So... <laughs> Preston, so, stop it! You, don't you know that themes are for eighth grade, eighth, eighth grade book reports? Don't right, you know? themes are made for eighth grade book reports. Now, so here's the thing. When you say, I guess when I say I like the term other, it's only because I have assumed that other is referring to, you know, the, the anthropological, sociological term of the other. Um, and that George is making a statement about that. If George is not making a statement about that, then I think you're completely correct, Carmine, that White Walker is a better name. <laughs> That it's just like, oh, then what? Then why did George choose the term other? Oh, no reason. Oh, he, you weren't referring I, I like to your the ex sociological, I anthropological like term of other? Oh, fuck. Oh. You should have just called them white walkers. <laughs> I like I like your term better, but no, um, like, like but it, it's like but it completely assumes it. It completely assumes that like George is taking the story in that direction, that the others aren't completely evil and 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 things like that. But uh, I don't know. To I, to non book readers, the uh, the White Walkers, the others, they don't appear that often in the books. Ever like. No. We we I, th I feel as though up until when the show stops adapting the books, we had slightly more appearances of the walkers in the show than we did the others in the books. Pretty oh, sure. Yeah, I mean the show has the show has a lot more references to the others. Um, I mean to the White Walkers, um, like because because you know essentially we get <clears throat> of the others themselves. You have Waymar Royce fighting one, and then you have. Sam, like attacking one, like, and then and that's uh, that's it. Sam, Sam killing one, and Waymar Royce. Isn't there an off-screen battle in both book and show? Um, at the Fist of the First Men. That's off-screen though. Right, but it might just be whites. True, 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 true. Right, but like in the, the show, the first we know men specifically... could be all whites. Hard home could be all whites. Um, um, Jaffer Flowers and and whoever like that's whites. Um, you know, but we in have the show, no... season two, season two ends with Sam seeing a White Walker general leading a white army. So technically, that counts. And of course, hard home that counts too. That's technically book territory. Season yeah. five. Uh, for those of you who don't know, season five is where like the book adaptations end. So yeah, we have slightly more of them in the show than we do in the uh, in the books. Huh? Yeah. George said, "When Winds of Winter comes out, we'll we'll go further north and deal with that." So who knows? <clears throat> All right, on to the aria that I missed. Okay, so um, another small wording change with potential significance to the stories. Endgame occurs in the drafts of A Storm of Swords, aria four, when 
word of the Kingslayer's release reaches Arya and her captors in the Brotherhood Without Banners, in both the draft and published versions, Arya is ordered outside by Greenbeard when the conversation turns to Jaime's release by Catelyn. But in the draft, Arya remains infuriated, infuriate, infuriated, infuriated by the rumor outside and says something interesting. It's not true. Um, um, Arya told herself as she ran out a back door, it couldn't be true. Behind the sept, an archer, uh, an archery butt had been set up and Angai was giving Gendry a lesson in the longbow. They took one look at her and lowered their bows. What's wrong? asked Gendry. It's just a lie, Arya told him angrily, almost shouting. She would, she never would. She, uh, if she did, I'd kill her too. Who? Her, Arya shouted. She couldn't bring herself to say her mother's name to them. Um, now, before we go on, I wanted to say that um, rereading now A Game of Thrones, there is just a lot of placed favorite, like obvious favoritism of, of Santa over Arya. That's not just imagined by by aria but real and legitimate like in 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 um in catalan's head like catalan in a game of thrones just clearly likes sansa more and clearly likes bran more like than like she likes bran more than rob and 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 rickon and she likes sansa more than aria like she definitely plays favorites um and so Sansa, I can understand because I, I yeah. feel as though Sansa has more in common with her mother than Arya would. Sure, it but it, it's Bran? also very, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what's going on in other people's heads, but there is a, I mean, now being a parent, like I, I actively try to like feel that I, that I love both of my children equally. Like, um, you know, that you, that you don't have a Sophie's choice, you know, like if there's a Sophie's choice with Catelyn, it's just like so clearly Sansa over Arya and so clearly Bran over over the other two kids. Like it's just like of the other two boys, you know. Um, however, it begins to get it begins changing later on because I think in A Storm of Swords, Cat starts Cat like specifically challenges Rob about about disinheriting Arya and, 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 um, or not, you know, writing his will and not, not, and talking about not giving things to Arya. And when we get to a feast for crows with Arya, Arya, um, names herself cat of the canals as like, she's trying to remember her mother. And there's more of like this idea of missing and loving her mother that, uh, so that, I think maybe like George had just more distance between Kat and Arya that he decided to to undo and be like, no, that's just not realistic. Like Arya's a little girl. Of course, she's going to love her mother. And of course, Kat is going to love her daughter. Like, of course, you know. So, I mean, it, it's not a subject I've like researched specifically, but it's just something I'm feeling right now. Um Having just rereading the beginning of a Game of Thrones and being like, huh, Kat's really, really a jerk to Arya. And Arya has real <laughs> problems with her mother. And then they're like, oh, that's not just like, you know, typical family argument. It's like legitimate. And like Arya is going to kill her mom. <laughs> like Arya wants to kill her mom. Um, a few readers have hypothesized that Arya is destined to kill Lady Stoneheart and that and that doing that could bring closure to both Stoneheart and Arya's arcs. It doesn't seem inevitable that Stoneheart will eventually it does seem inevitable that Stoneheart will eventually meet one of her children again. Uncatalan still deserves uh, a modicum of closure and comfort and Arya is as likely as any given that George tried to connect them late in Storm via Nymeria's retrieval of Catalan's body. Yeah, that's the other thing. Is Arya's trying so desperately to get to Catalan at the Red Wedding. You need to establish like that that love of like, oh my God, I got to get to my mom. I got to get to protection. If, if she's like, oh, I, I'm going to kill my mom because she 
because she let she let Jamie out of jail. Um, I also uh, want I, I strongly disagree with the idea that it'll be Arya who ends up killing Lady Stoneheart. I think oh, that, I do too. Yeah, it's Brienne or Jamie's story right there. Oh, yeah, Mostly Brienne. It's it's <clears throat> thematically Lady Stoneheart has has little to do with Arya. Um, I mean, cat might, but you'd have to, I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to close things off with Jamie and Brienne and then move Lady Stoneheart into another different direction, um, to bring it back to like, to Arya and, and, and Sansa. It's just, I um, think I also, I also think the idea that Arya will be around the Riverlands area for following the show where Arya mm. eventually goes back to the Riverlands to kill the Freys. If Lady Stoneheart will even be alive by then, like right. I, I, that, that I, I don't see how that would happen in the books. I, there's no way Jamie and Brienne leave that situation with Lady Stoneheart with everyone alive. Yeah, I mean the, um, you know, I've, I've been obviously mulling this over a lot in the fanfic, you know, and it's like when I'm really thinking about like, okay, Brienne's story, if it's if it's re if Brienne is really talking about you know, the nature of morality and, and, and in the same sense as Jamie, she needs to, she needs to kill Lady Stoneheart in the same way that Jamie killed Ares. Um, because that's, that's the whole idea that, that we, we shouldn't think that, that vowing your allegiance to someone and just, just, uh, passing the puck on, on morality is, is, is good. Right. So like, Lady Stoneheart, Brienne, Brienne is is bound to follow Lady Stoneheart. She she she, and Lady Stoneheart told her to kill Jamie, and it's like, well, you know that like Brienne can't do that. <laughs> like Brienne's not gonna fucking kill Jamie, you know. So it's you know she's got to do something like kill Lady Stoneheart in the same way as as, as Ares, and that that breaks her, that frees her. But at the same time, like, what do you do? Like, is Lady Stoneheart gone after that? Or can do you have, like, Lady Stoneheart rise the same way Beric Dondarrion did? You, like, stab her and she collapses and then she just gets up again like Beric Dondarrion did. And you're like, ah, oh, fuck. Then you can then you could say, like, okay, Brienne and Jamie are resolved and you can do something else, else with Lady Stoneheart. Um, and then maybe she, Lady Stoneheart could meet Sansa or Arya or whoever little finger but you, you need you need to have her you need to have her have her role in the brianna jamie story but anyway um, that's actually um that's actually i'm sorry before we move on from that topic yeah. that's actually that's such a good point i also didn't realize that catelyn's body after you know they s s cut her throat and and threw her in the river her body must be so fucking like it, it must be so fucked up. Oh that, yeah, more more fucked up than Barrack. Yeah. Right. So what can put her down for good? Valyrian steel. That's true. And who carries Valyrian steel? <laughs> you know, Brienne. And I mean, and there's a missed... certain uh, certain irony of like killing the person that you've 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 made an oath with with mm -hmm. a with a sword called Oathkeeper, like, oh my god, it's just like the irony of it, right? Like, uh, that you're George breaking your oath this, uh, with, video you're video literally video. breaking your oath with a sword called Oathkeeper. <laughs> I wonder if afterwards she'll give Jamie the sword back because she broke she broke uh, her oath, and he's like, nah, keep it. Oathbreaker. Where are proud <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he can go get Widow's Whale or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh there it is but widow's whale is back in king's landing with tommen uh. um let's see um <laughs> but anyway even if that line was significant it was written 25 and deleted 25 years ago <laughs> that's true i mean at this point <laughs> um there are a few other small changes in the Arya draft. Uh, while traveling with the Brotherhood, there's a deleted mention of a, the group visiting an underground river. That's interesting. 
A few days later, the searchers sheltered down below the ground in Torchlit Cavern beside the underground river. One of the cave dwellers said the Lightning Lord had gone to White Crown. Another insisted that uh, he'd been at Acorn Hill. So this, you know, it's just there's a million parallels to the Brotherhood without banners and their situation and stuff going on north of the wall. Um, Beric Tendarian sits on a Weirwood throne underground. Like he sits on a, a throne of roots. He has one eye. He's, he's under the earth in a hollow hill. Um, he's, he's, it's the exact same situation as, as blood Raven, blood Raven, one eye, Weirwood throne beneath the earth, beneath where a tree was. Um, I mean, Beric is, the Weirwood's gone, but they're still in the hollow hill where the Weirwood was. <clears throat> um, you know, having an underground river is, you know, just more, I mean, more similarities. Um, also clearly a reference to you. It's not oh, much, yeah. but those who suspect that Westeros is riddled with an underground network of caverns might find that interesting. That's true. Um, the, reference, the reference to White Crown is the original name of, of High Heart, the hill ringed um, by ancient weirwood stumps. Oh, right. So the like the crown, like Queen's crown, White Crown would be like weirwood. The weirwoods would make the crown. Um, and in the same lore but gets much less prose in the draft. No character like the ghost of high heart exists in this version. Huh? I mean, I guess the ghost of high. <sighs> yeah. The ghost of high heart is just, it is kind of a tacked on thing that doesn't really add anything. It just adds some prophecies, fill, fill some pages and you, you can't the really like comment. These are fun. You, you, they are. People love it. People fucking love the Ghost of High Heart. And he can't, he needs to know, all, like, he needs to finish the book to know which prophecies he's going to shove in, right? I guess, yeah. <laughs> um, Arya's tra chapter Traveling with the Brotherhood also includes a hint of a deleted subplot. When they arrive at Acorn Hill, yeah, Lady Smallwood is, I always am just like, what's the significance of this Lady Smallwood stuff? When they when they arrive at Acorn Hill, Lady Smallwood informs their, them of an ominous sounding singer named Honeytongue, who is searching for Beric Dondarrion. Smallwood says that Honeytongue wants to find Beric and make him into a song. He claims, which sounds a lot like a not very subtle assassin to me. Smallwood says that she directed him to the Inn of the Kneeling Man. Perhaps George meant for him to kill Sharna and husband. The inn's current occupants. Huh. Honey tongue. There's also an interesting change to Sandra Clegane's dialogue when Arya tries to kill him after he defeats Beric. The draft of that chapter contains some deleted lines indicating some serious self-loathing underneath his main exterior. You killed Micah, she said once more in a voice gone soft and small. I did. His voice broke and then he began to cry. Mother of mercy, I did. I wrote him down and I cut him in half. And the little bird, the, the pretty little bird, I let them beat her. Gods be good, girl. Do it. You hear me? Do it. Um, hmm. That material is mostly cut and moved to, you know, a, song, uh, a Storm of Swords Aria 13. In her, uh, yeah, where that's when he begs for the gift of mercy. Um, but in this context, Sandra's confession functions partly as manipulation to get her to end his suffering in the draft context, his self-loathing seems more honest. Uh, yeah, that's true. Absolutely. I like that. Yeah. Now the move, the move is, is definitely a really great, really great. Uh, um, cause G stuff is correct that like him begging her to, kill him you don't know if he's just trying to get he's trying to goad her into killing him and he's using whatever methods possible or if he actually really does feel bad about micah you know could go either way Porque no las dos? yeah anyway that, that was yeah george 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 did did very well moving it it shouldn't be it shouldn't be that early on um the honey tongue one um random yeah. 
uh, I know someone in the, the comments to this post uh, is theorizing that, that could that be Jockin? But no, Jockin is in um, in Old Town, or so we think. Yeah, by by a storm of swords. Yeah, he should be he should be gone. Yeah, honey tongue. Make him into a song. But it's another one of those things about you know song pe per person being a memory, being a song, afterlife. Um. Hmm. All right, the red wedding. The July 1999 draft of A Storm of Swords doesn't include the Red Wedding itself. George uh, has said it was the last chapter he wrote for A Storm, but it does include some deleted foreshadowing that may affect your theories about how it was planned. Here's the original final page of A Storm of Swords, Tyrion III, Tyrion's first small council meeting with Tywin. The interesting thing um, about this passage is Tywin's reference to Tyrion building his chain back in Clash. This suggests that Tywin was somehow planning Rob's death long before Rob had even met Jane Westerling. Let me see this. Um, Am I, am I reading this correctly? Let me think here. The foreshadowing strikes me as problematic on multiple levels. It weakens the shock impact of the Red Wedding itself and shows Tywin hinting way too casually to others about the incre an incredibly sensitive plot and requires an implausible level of foresight uh, from Tywin, especially during the chaos of the, of the war. So I'm glad the passage was dele deleted. Um, he says, <clears throat> Rob Stark is as capable as I am, presumably, and sworn to marry one of those fertile frays. And once the young wolf sires a, a litter, any pup that stands at births are heirs to nothing. Every once in a long while, Tywin Lannister would threaten to smile. He never did. But that threat alone was terrible to behold. Rob Stark will father no children on his fertile fray. You have my solemn word. Tyrion cocked his head. How can you prevent it? I won't need to. The boy prevented it himself. A man's seed goes cold under the earth, Tyrion. While you were for forging your chain for Stannis, I was digging a grave for a direwolf, and young Lord Stark was obliged enough to step in it. All that remains now is for us to throw a little dirt on his face before he can climb out. Now, <clears throat> so the, huh? Rob stepped into that bullshit with the the phrase betraying him on his own when he decided to do what he did with Jane Westerling. There's no way Tywin could have could have prepared for that or planned for uh, that. So. I'm trying to think. Um, oh, when he slept with Jane Westerling, though, was I'm trying to think. That was after the storming of the crag, right? And the storming of the crag happens in. Trying to think here. The Storming of the Crag happens in Clash. The Crag is stormed by night. Um, no, wait. Maybe it happens before. Or it happens like kind of n n between where Clash and everything. Here we go. It says, after taking Ashmark, along with the Westerman castles, the Starks move on to the crag. Um, and so that happens in Cat 6, A Clash of Kings. So, um, 
the thing is I've, I've, I've kind of been down this, I've once talked about this, this, uh, topic before. So before I became very obsessed with, um, time traveling Bran, you know, I was, I was, I was going through prophecies and being like, well, they're all bullshit. And, and uh, most people bring up like, well, what about the red wedding? Cause Danny clearly sees the red wedding, um, at the house of the undying how and then I'll, you know and so i was like well the red wedding hadn't happened yet but the idea for the red wedding could have happened and so if we go back yeah there it is so catalan six the the um the black water is over here at davos three Tyrion 13 Sansa six, Tyrion fourteen. This is this is the Blackwater over in the 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 fifty eighth, the fifty eighth, you know, kind of their their chapters. Catalan six is over at forty five. So, if Tywin was planning the Red Wedding, like when, like essentially, Rob gets injured. And the 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 um the Westerlings send their letters to Tywin, and Tywin sends back. You better get your daughter to to sleep with Rob Stark. That would be at the same time that Tyrion is forging the chain. But that also requires Rob to be a dumb fuck, and the whole situation with I the way I always saw it was that the reason that happened was because he was in a moment of weakness. He just got injured. Um, you know, the news about his brothers is, is still on his mind and getting laid takes his mind off it. Fine. But there's no way Tywin could have. I mean, I think the thing that's planned. the thing that's not predictable to me is like, I think, yeah, you can you can feed a kid Viagra. Plus, he's 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 whatever, 15 year old boy. Like, you know, fine. You can you can throw a girl in his bed and and get him to have sex. That that's the easy part. The hard part is him afterwards being like, yup, got to marry her. Like, that's the part that's unbelievable, <laughs> right? right? Like, that's yeah. the part you can't control. Um, Like, it requires you to, like, even with, like, northern, even with this, like, sense of duty and honor, like, in the in times of war, like, someone someone wouldn't just be like, no, nah, no, nah, not this time. Not this time. Not when, not when I, have, I have a war and I need the phrase. Like, that's the part that's unbelievable is that they knew Rob would actually marry Jane Westerling rather than just President, unbelievable. Like Tywin's a great strategist, but the motherfucker's not out here playing 7D chess. Like yeah. there's no way. There's no right. way. So, I mean, the the thought of 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 Tywin having having come up with the red wedding very early and as early as as when the the vision appears in in um in the house of the undying. Yeah. That's one, you know, but, um, yeah, to, but I mean, it's very much implied that, that it's at least implied that yes, the Westerlings did throw their daughter at Rob. Um, cause they got no punishment. They got no punishment. In fact, they were rewarded later. So it seems like they did do something. So I do, you know, I do think that even though it doesn't really make any sense to like what, what know that Rob was going to marry this woman, I think it's pretty much implied that yes, like they threw their daughter in there and and were well, what happy. What should they get though from Rob? What? Right. I mean, I don't know how they. I don't know how they they ensured that he married her, but. But there's no reason that the daughter should be in there taking care of Rob. Like that's just in, in in any normal circumstance. She shouldn't be in there. There should be a maester in there, no one else. You don't you don't uh you just you don't throw your daughter, you don't, you know. I mean, I was talking to my I was talking to my sister about like my nephew and you know, he was invited to a, to a, he's, he's 14 and he was invited to a sleepover where there was going to be girls. And 
my, 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 you know, my sister's like, nah, nah, let's not, let's not do that. You know, like, <laughs> and then, so, and then, this is, this is, uh, this is a totally different time. You know, like you're not throwing your daughter in there to take care of Rob unless you want her to sleep with Rob. So, you know, I do think that like, yes, it was the plan. That sleep was with Rob plan. in the hopes that she softens him enough to give them like an easier time to like not behead everybody in there, which that was my, that was always my assumption. My whole thing is the reason the red wedding plans came together was the moment um, Bruce Bolton learned about Rob and Jane and Vargo Hope brought Jamie to, to him. This was a perfect opportunity for Bruce. And then that's how the plan came together. There's no way. Yeah. I don't, I, you're right. It's unbelievable. No way. I mean, some would say like the biggest line, um, the biggest line that that kind of shows that that was left in is Tywin says some some wars are won with with Quill. He says some wars, some wars are won. Some battles are won with sword and spears. Others are with quills and ravens. So a lot of people point to that. That's Tyrion three, a storm of swords. So, oh, he says that. I'm sorry. He says that in Tyrion one. Um, Tyrion thinks about it again, but he says some battles are won with swords and spears, others with quills and ravens. So some people say that, okay, what was left in the book is that Tyrion or Tywin was already thinking about the Red Wedding in Tyrion 1, A Storm of Swords. Which is well, well, well. I mean, that's before we even hear about Rob arriving to shock Catelyn. So it can't just be, the Red Wedding can't just be like, oh, they heard about the marriage. Let's capitalize on it. It had to have been happening before that. So this just, just this just makes it. So I mean, anyway, G. Steph says, "Look, I um, he says, the foreshadowing strikes me as problematic on multiple levels. It weakens the shock shock impact of the Red Wedding, and it shows that Tywin's hinting way too casually about it, about its sensitive plot. I mean, he kind of hints at it pretty casually." In Tyrion 1, 2. And it requires an implausible level of foresight for Tywin during the chaos of war. Um, the story still does that. I'm glad this passage was deleted. I'm fine, you know, yeah, I'm fine it's deleted too. But I'm saying George still left in all of that, all of that stuff. He already makes Tywin's foresight unbelievable. Give, give us a, an example of that. I'm just talking like saying that some wars are won with quills and ravens is is like is saying that he planned the red wedding as early as Tyrion one. That's before most people know, certainly Tywin, that Rob has No 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 I, I I meant like examples of, of Tywin's insane foresight in the published version. That's what I'm talking about. The Quills and Ravens thing is published. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I misunderstood you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying I'm saying that the this like this pushes it back a bit, but it doesn't change very much. Like Tywin planning, Tywin conspiring with the Westerlings to to have Jane Westerling seduce Rob. Um like that already makes Tywin like ridiculous because there's no way that he would have been able to actually predict that Rob would have married her. Um, it's just a level of understanding of a boy that goes beyond because even, even Kat, here's the problem with it. Okay. One would think Catelyn would know her own son better than Tywin. And yet even Catelyn is shocked that Rob went as far as marrying her after sleeping with her. 
So like somehow Tywin knows Rob better than Catelyn. But anyway, anyway, we're we're beating this dead horse. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, I generally don't look at the final drafts during during library visits, but my time is limited because my time is limited. But I made the exception for the Red Wedding. Um, here's the late draft of the second to last page of the chapter. Uh, with copy editing annotations. As you can see, Catelyn's death was originally more gruesome. It had her raking her face with her nails. She tore off her lips and ears. The copy editor said that it was too much. Oh, I see. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was unnecessary. The birds bore off her lips that Ned had, had kissed uh, and ripped the ears from her head that had heard him pledge his love. Is that what that word is? is it birds? Yeah. Okay. It hurts so much. Our children, Ned, all, all our sweet babes, Rick and Bran, Arya, Sansa, Rob, Rob, please, Ned, make it stop. Make it stop hurting. The white tears and red ones ran together until her face was torn and tattered, her face that Ned had loved. The birds, and then the birds bore off her lips that Ned had kissed and ripped off the ears that had heard him pledge his love. Catelyn raised her hands and watched the blood run down her, her long fingers over her wrists beneath the sleeves of her gown. Like slow red worms, it crawled all the way through her arms and her clothes. It tickles. It made me laugh until she screamed. Mad, someone said. She's lost her wits. Someone else said, make an end. And a hand grabbed her scalp, just said she'd done with Jingle Bell. And she thought, no, no, don't cut my hair. Ned loves my hair. The steel was at her throat and the bite was red and cold. Um, yeah, yeah, they cut, uh, copy editor cut that out. That's probably true. Too much. Um, I'll cover the, re the remainder of vaguely interesting things from Storm. Sam's flashback, uh, the Battle of the Fist was originally included, included Dolores Ed saying, the first time since we've been here that I don't have a night watch and it's see what happens. I think George should have kept that line. That's that's true, but I, I guess he didn't, that. Want it, didn't want it to be too funny. Maybe we'll steal that, put it back in. After Tywin shows Tyrion the two Valyrian steel swords he'd created from the Metal of Ice, there's a deleted line which Tywin mentions that Robert owned a bronze rune blade 6,000 years old, a dragon glass dirk made by the children of the, children of the forest, and doubtless hundreds more. The reference to the Dragonglass Dirk is the same in the same book that John discovers a cache of them and Sam used one to kill another was likely meant as a hint to the reader that John of where John's stash originally came from. Um, Does he mean where Robert's stash originally came from? Well, see, th here's the, here's what I'm 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 confused in this in this wording. A bronze rune blade, a six thousand years old, a dragonglass dirk made by the children of the forest, and doubtless hundreds more. Um, doubtless hundreds more. Is that referring to just any dagger, or does it specifically mean dragonglass daggers? Because I take it, it as it almost seems like Robert has at least in the vaults or something. I don't know, like more artifacts because he's listing off a bunch of artifacts. Right, but I don't think it. I don't think it means he has hundreds of of dragonglass daggers. I think it might just mean he has hundreds of daggers. And then the reference to a dragonglass dirk in the same book that John discovers the cash was likely meant as a hint to the reader where John's stash was originally came for, or maybe a a red herring, like the idea that somehow. The the stash of dragon glass was taken from was taken from Robert's armory at Winterfell and then brought north of the Wall and stashed that. Uh, it's, uh... Or was he just? 
Oh, or, or is he? Oh, I think I think G stuff is just talking about from the tr- children of, of the forest. That the stash ca- came from the children of the forest. That it was buried by the children of the forest. I think is maybe what's being said here. I'm sorry. Now it seems rather clear that we're supposed to think that the children buried that stash rather than anybody else. <clears throat> um, on the topic of of swords, the ancient Lannister family sword Bright Roar was originally named Black Roar. Um, John's first chapter contains contains another blatant hint that he'll live on as ghost after dying. After Harna threatens John, Varamir, who was originally named Rendhor in the draft, says, "If you mean to kill him, I'd best hunt down that direwolf." Or his shade will soon be stalking us. Yeah, okay. There it is. But I mean, Orel's eagle already has that in it because he's like he talk. They already talk about like Orel's eagle having the shade of Orel in him, and and the hatred of John living on in it. There's a deleted Sansa flashback in which she meets Dantos in the Godswood and rejects his rescue plan in the belief that she'll soon be going to Highgarden to marry Willis Tyrell. By the end of the chapter, she's married to Tyrion. And in the published book, Jamie successfully saves Brienne from being raped by the Brave Companions via Sa- the Sapphire's Ruse. In the draft, Bra- Brienne is raped repeatedly and after a while fully submits to it, lying there like a dead fish as it happens. Going Jesus. this way would have made yeah would have made Brienne a broken character and harder to find inspiration in. Uh, plus, it would have weakened the connection between Jamie and Brienne and the cruelty of her ultimately betraying him. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole thing is that like Jamie, Jamie loses, Jamie sacrifices his hand to, um. Or no, I'm trying to I'm trying to piecing everything together. No, he gets beaten over and over again. Um, his hand gets taken immediately. Um, so I guess he doesn't sacrifice his hand, but his uh, his hand is taken immediately. But he's beaten over and over again in order to um, save Brienne. So at least he's there's that sacrifice. Um, yeah. So yeah, I agree that it's yeah it's probably best that it's best that they, they remove that. Um, and that's the conclusion there. Did um. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Uh, this- that that last part, my God, that got a little uh little dark. I'm glad. Uh, yeah, that this. that's how we're ending things. <laughs> <laughs> He says, this concludes Act 2 of my research of George's A Song of Ice and Fire draft. I hope you've enjoyed reading it as much as I've enjoyed writing it. I look forward to returning to College Station one final time for Act 3, if and when Wins is released, to study the current closed drafts of Dance with Dragons. This is what G7 was talking about with um, with uh, um, there are certain drafts that are not open to the public. Hmm. Thanks, as always, to the staff of the Cushing Library who could not uh, have been more helpful. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, let's um, thank thank G Steph for, for all of his work uh, heading to the library. Of making course, the trip. we got we to gotta have him on and, and just, you know, shoot the shit with him. I'm sure he has way more information that he hasn't put on here. We can ask him right. About I think the things he may trip. have forgotten or something like that. Things that weren't covered. Mm-hmm. I know for a fact that he has a lot to say in regards to uh, George's dealings with uh, various video game publishers and how there have been uh, people trying to get a game made for from, from Game of Thrones for quite some time, amongst other people trying to scam George. Remember, uh, for those of you who don't remember, I had conversations with G. Steph beforehand, um, oh. and uh, yeah, he has a lot more to say on that. So uh, pretty soon. We'll have him on and uh, we'll just uh, shoot the shit with him. Yeah, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, all of his work is really fantastic. I mean, some of the best. I mean, I can't think of, you know, since the, I would say like since the release of the Forsaken chapter, um, 
what what has been more enlightening and and uh on the nature of like the story you know than 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 his research and in, in going and looking through the drafts like nothing you know right yeah I, I'm I'm inclined to agree. Um, after having such a large content drought for ten plus years, yeah, I mean, what else can you say? But other than he he's made very big contributions to the fandom. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Fantastic stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for uh, sticking with us, and we'll talk to you next time. All right. Bye.